Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be here with you and to be in this uh, beautiful city, this beautiful country. Uh, I'll show you actually my second talk today where I live in the United States, which is a very small rural state where basically no one lives there. So it's very interesting for me to come and uh, visit a country where lots of people live. I'm going to talk about a topic which is a continuation really of the third presentation we just had. Okay, my disclosures. Thank you. <laughs> okay. The issue of cardiovascular management and prevention. Oh. Can we try again? The issue in terms of cardiovascular prevention in the diabetes world has been a complicated subject. If we go back to the 1990s with really the stunning results with the DCCT in type 1 diabetes, the UK PDS in type 2 diabetes, in terms of prevention of microvascular disease, then certainly questions turned to what we could do about cardiovascular disease. And unfortunately, the many trials which looked at different drugs and looked at improving glucose values generally in various types of patients were, were unimpressive, were a bit disappointing in terms of what we could do from a cardiovascular point of view. I point out to you that's true except for the, the data which came from the DCCT and the UK PDS and other trials showing that very early intensive blood glucose control instills a memory effect in terms of cardiovascular protection in diabetes, but beyond that the trials were unimpressive. That doesn't mean to say that cardiovascular risks have not improved in the diabetes world over the last 20 years because of all the benefits in terms of general health care related to cardiac disease. The establishment of standards of care in the diabetes world for blood pressure, for glycemic management, for lipid management, all based on outcome trials translated into overall a large improvement in cardiovascular risk and that's documented in a New England Journal paper looking at the results from the United States that you see here from 1990 to 2010 some of the largest improvements in terms of complications in the diabetes world had occurred in the cardiovascular uh, realm. Having said that, there are still some really important questions which were unanswered, which is, are any of the available diabetic pharmaceuticals beneficial from a cardiovascular point of view? And what do we do with heart failure? I think, frankly, in the diabetes specialty world, there hasn't been a lot of discussion about heart failure as opposed to standard atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. All of that's particularly true when we look at the kinds of studies that have been done with our individual drugs. When you look at standard cardiovascular outcomes, MACE, and look at the different drugs, we actually have been through a period of relative disappointment. The ORIGIN trial looking at Glargine, the DPP-4 trials not showing benefit and in fact raising issues about risk related to heart failure. Uh, really left uh, very little positive information in terms that any individual drug might bring cardiovascular benefits. Certainly there was some suggestive data that thiazolidine diones might be helpful, but the famous proactive study confused things by creating a primary outcome which was quite complicated, more complicated than we usually think about, and it actually did not show a statistical benefit. Now, when we went into 2000, the mid-2000s, 2015, whether we thought there would be any impact of GLP-1 drugs, there, there was hope. We certainly knew, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, that the biological properties of the incretin system seemed to have impact on positive cardiovascular effects. But we had trials using the oral DPP-4s, and they hadn't shown a benefit. So I don't think everyone would have predicted we see anything positive with the GLP-1 drugs. And certainly with the SGLT-2s, there was no great reason beyond their blood pressure lowering impact to think that they might do something beneficial in terms of the heart. Even less was known about heart failure. And in fact, we had essentially no background information to support the individual drug effects from the diabetes world have any, having any huge positive impact. 
in terms of heart failure risk. And in fact, we knew some of our drugs had uh, negative effects, primarily thiazolidine diones uh, and the newest information with the DPP-4s. And so we talked about it, and we had a number of failed cardiovascular outcome trials using intensive lifestyle modification and a variety of drugs, which led to, I think, a general almost depression as we got into the 2011s, 12s, 13s, 14s, going to the ADA, and each year essentially having failed uh, negative cardiovascular outcomes. Things did change in the United States because in 2008 the FDA mandated that all new diabetes therapies were required to have cardiovascular safety, and I emphasize the word safety trials, not protection trials, based on the rosy glitazone data which initially had supported there might be cardiovascular risks with that drugs. And so almost like a bad Hollywood movie, or I guess where I am, a Bollywood movie, all of a sudden, we went to the ADA in 2015 with the huge surprise of the benefits which were seen with one of the diabetes drugs, empagliflozin, and I want to focus on that trial for a second, although we've discussed it already in the prior discussion at some length. So we're going to talk about the SGLT2 drugs, and I think those drugs are well known to virtually everybody in this audience, essentially drugs which promote glycosuria and along with that salt and water excretion and better blood pressures, uh, weight reduction because of caloric excretion and also metabolic changes including the increase in ketone production as was already discussed extensively in the prior talk. So what was the EMPA-REG trial? The empa -TREG trial was a cardiovascular safety study using this drug, drug empagliflozin, and you see the details on the right. All of these trials are done in patients at high cardiovascular risk. The empa -REG trial, all of the patients, in fact, were known to have established cardiovascular disease, and in fact, the patient makeup becomes an important discussion when we look at different trials and different drugs and different outcomes. There were 7,000 patients. The duration was an average of a little more than three years. And the basic design of the trial was standard of care uh, with or without the addition of empagliflozin. There were two dosages of empagliflozin which happened to be used and the data were mean together in terms of looking at the uh, cardiac outcomes. And the major cardiac outcome was a standard three-point MACE which was looking at death from cardiovascular disease, non-fatal MI, or non-fatal stroke. So what you see in the top left-hand corner is in fact the primary outcome, which did in fact show a statistically positive result supporting protection. What you see is a 14% reduction, so the relative risk was 0 0.86, 0 0.84, I can't read. Uh, 0.86, I think, uh, and making statistical significance. The other major findings that you see on the slider, the top right, was a huge dramatic improvement in terms of cardiovascular death, and on the bottom left, also death of all causes. And I think one could argue that if you want a positive uh, outcome with a drug, a reduction in death is pretty good. Unexpected, and I think startling, is the results of the bottom right of the panel, which was this enormous reduction in heart failure, frankly something which was not expected, and I think in many ways drove the huge interest in this study. Go to the next slide. Can we go, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. Um, and, and I want to focus on that heart failure pattern because what one sees and what's already been mentioned in the prior discussion is not only this huge reduction in heart failure, but how quickly it occurred. I, I'm losing my control here. So that, in fact, what stunned the audience was that there was a divergent of, of the curves within a just few weeks of being on this drug and clearly supporting that the mechanism of action could not simply uh, 
be an intervention in terms of the progression of cardiac disease and atherosclerosis protection had to be something very different and that's generated the whole discussion we heard just a few minutes ago about diuresis, ketone bodies, a variety of other molecular mechanisms. There was a second element There was a second element to this study, which also was totally unexpected, and that was looking at renal outcomes. Now, the inclusion criteria for this study is allowed people with modest renal dysfunction, but not severe renal dysfunction. So everybody had to have a GFR above 30. There was somewhere in the range of about 20% of patients who had some microalbuminuria, minimal uh, macroproteinuria. And so uh, these patients were then studied uh, uh, as their renal outcomes, a secondary um, analysis. So what you see on the left was the surprising observation that this drug empagliflozin, in fact, seemed to stabilize renal function in these individuals with only a modest degree of renal dysfunction to start and a very large uh, improvement in terms of the composite renal outcome on the right. The composite renal outcome consisted of either transition to macro proteinuria, a doubling of serum creatinine, moving on to dialysis, or a very rare uh, renal-related death. So again, really stunning results in terms of what this drug did in terms of renal protection as well as cardiac protection. Now, of course, one of the discussion points was mechanisms of action, which we've already had extensive discussion about a few minutes ago. But the second question that came up, is this a agent-specific observation, or is this, in fact, a class uh, effect? And so we waited for the second trial, and the second trial were the CANVAS trials, which were reported on this year's uh, American Diabetes Association just a little more than a month ago. The CANVAS trials are confusing because they turn out to be a combination of two trials. As you heard earlier, the first trial, CANVAS alone, was added to with the CANVAS R trial in part because the original CANVAS data was used in interim analysis and presented to the FDA in terms of promoting the initial uh, cardiac outcome of less than 1.8 to allow approval of that drug. And so a second trial, Canvas R with a slightly different protocol in terms of drug dosing was started, but these, uh, these trials are quite similar in terms of the patient population, and so they've been combined together in terms of the data related to cardiovascular outcomes in the Canvas trials. What you see on the right is there were over 10,000 people, somewhat different from the prior trial that uh, a portion of these people did not have known cardiovascular disease, and in total that amounted to about a third of the patients, uh, and two-thirds of the patients did have established cardiovascular disease. The primary outcome, again, was a three-point MACE. And so what you see on the top right is similar results in terms of a positive cardiovascular outcome, statistical significance in terms of protection and safety, uh, with a very similar relative rate of 0.86 that was seen with empagliflozin. But having said that, when, when one starts to look at the pattern of results with some group analysis, in fact, there were interesting differences. The other thing I'll point out is that there was this safety signal related to amputation. Uh, I also have attended advisory boards related to amputation discussion in the United States. One of the things that's very important in the people who underwent amputation is most of them had either peripheral vascular disease or a prior amputation. So they're clearly at a higher risk in terms of using these drugs. Most of the amputations were toes or uh, up to the metatarsal, so very few uh, um, larger leg amputations. And I think the prevailing opinion in the United States now, mechanism-based is unclear, but there is some considerable interest about potential diuretic effect in these peoples with pre-established uh, uh, long uh, uh, peripheral vascular disease issues. Now, what, what I want to do is I want to take you through the subgroup analysis a little bit with this trial because it's kind of interesting. 
Uh, the first thing I'll point out is that in the AMPA reg trial, there was some divergence in terms of a huge improvement in death, but actually a higher relative rate with stroke, although it was not statistically significant. One of the things with the CANVAS trials you see is essentially all of the individual components to the MACE fell on the left of the dividing line, but did really not reach statistical significance. So that this was all based now on just the total MACE observation, not any individual component. The second thing I will point out is that a dominant finding in the AMPA reg trial was a big improvement in terms of death. Now that was not true in this trial, but when you look at the subgroup analysis, you can see death of any cause is approaching significance. So uh, one wonders in a different patient population, different kind of study design, uh, not the putting the two trials together. Maybe you would have seen that same improvement in death. Uh, clearly also Canvas showed a big improvement and safety factor related to heart failure. So I think one begins to believe that that is in fact a class effect. And similarly saw, one saw big improvement in terms of renal outcomes. One also would then predict this is another class effect related to the SGLT2 inhibitors. There's been so much interest in heart failure uh, and again uh, believing it's a class effect, and because of that, this study actually got a considerable amount of notoriety. First presented at a cardiology uh, international meeting and now published in circulation. This is a real world study, a real world study of looking at the use of different SGLT2 inhibitors in six countries where there are large, well-defined databases which can be searched in the US, in Norway, in Denmark, in Sweden, in Germany, in the United Kingdom. So in total, there were 300,000 patients who uh, were included in this study. Half of them had newly been started on an SGLT2, and half the controls had not. You see the basic characteristics of these individuals. There was a very small known history of heart failure, just 3%, 13% were known to have some cardiovascular disease, and 27% had some microvascular disease. Also, by the breakdown around the world as to the relative use of these different medicines, most or about half the patients were on canagliflozin, uh, about 40% were on dapagliflozin, and a very small proportion were on empagliflozin, the third of those agents to come to us. And what this study showed really reinforces the general take-home messages we've had related to these class effects. Uh, a large improvement in terms of heart failure risks in this population, about a 40% reduction. Uh, also a large reduction in terms of all-cause death, about a 50% reduction. Uh, and they could identify no heterogeneity among the different countries. And so based on all of that, I think that a prevailing opinion that uh, is now present in the diabetes specialty world about SGLT2s is the following. In terms of class effects, they seem to promote a dramatic and rapid reduction in clinically significant heart failure, even in people who are not known to have heart failure. And I think what the cardiologists are teaching us that a large proportion of our patients probably are at risk or have clinically yet unidentified heart failure uh, and that's going to be much more of, a, of an identified problem as we go forward in the diabetes world. Equally, there's a dramatic reduction in the onset and progression of chronic kidney disease, and I think it's actually very dramatic in terms of what those results have shown. Likely an important reduction in overall death. And one of the things that's interesting is when you look at the data, it seems that these drugs are effective, maybe even more effective in some of our sicker patients as opposed to healthy patients. The mechanism of action, I'll have nothing else to say because it was discussed at length uh, in the prior talk, but at least there's a general agreement. This can't be a disease improvement and or reduction in atherosclerotic effect because of the rapid onset, it must be something else and a lot of interest in ketones has already been discussed. Whether there are side effects that differ uh, within individual agents is a very hot topic of discussion now, and amputation is the one which is being focused on, although a bone fracture is another issue which is being discussed for which we need considerably more data.
And then finally, there's a lot of interest that SGLT2s might actually be useful drugs for heart failure independent of diabetes, and a number of large uh, clinical trials are now either, uh, uh, being planned or under investigation. So we'll learn a lot more about that into the years to come. Now I want to switch gears and I want to talk about the second drug class for which there's been so much discussion uh, over the last couple of years since 2015, and that's the injected incretin drugs, the GLP-1 receptor agonists. Uh, there was enormous interest that these drugs might actually bring to us uh, cardiovascular protection before the SGLT2 data came out. And that's because the biology of GLP-1 in particular, but also GIP, is amazingly interesting with those receptors expressed in tissues throughout the body and a large number of uh, um, organ uh, improvement advantages identified, not simply the incretin effect on terms of insulin and glucagon secretion, but also the weight reduction in terms of satiety and increased energy expenditure, uh, a, a, a relatively dramatic enhancement in terms of insulin sensitivity at both the liver and muscle level, uh, a lot of information about cardiovascular effects in terms of vasodilatation with lowered blood pressure, also increased cardiac uh, uh, dynamics and contractility, and then uh, GIP actually has an important effect on uh, anabolic uh, bone health. Um, unfortunately, our hopes were dashed a little bit with the trials using the DPP-4 inhibitors, of which there are clearly three, and none of which showed any cardiac protection, and two of which showed signals for heart failure. So I think we went into this with uh, less hope uh, that, in fact, these uh, classes would, in fact, bring us something clinically important. Uh, and then those hopes were further dashed by the first cardiovascular outcome trial done with a GLP-1 receptor agonist. That's the trial using lixizantatide, Elixa, which also showed no cardiac benefit. Now that's a complicated trial because these were considerably sicker patients than we were used to in most of the trials because an inclusion criteria was, uh, was uh, recent cardiac angina issues uh, along with standard uh, cardiovascular uh, other uh, inclusion criteria. But again, this was a negative trial and so I think the general feeling was maybe we were going to face negative trials generally with these drugs. And then, of course, LEADER came out. Again, to uh, some surprise, uh, reported at the ADA last year, but again showing, as you see, results that were rather dramatic. dramatic. And with a pattern initially which was reminiscent of the uh, EMPA-REG trial. Because what you see on the left was a 13% uh, uh, reduction in the primary outcome, cardiac benefit. And on the right, that came with a significant reduction in uh, death from cardiac causes. But of course, as one starts to look at that data and also some of the subgroup analysis, it became immediately clear that in fact there were important differences in terms of the outcomes between the GLP-1 drug study and the SGLT2 study. And that is that unlike the dramatic results that where there was deviation of the curves within just a few weeks to three months in the EMPA-REG trial, this took between 12 and 18 months with the GLP-1 drugs, suggesting that there was a higher likelihood the mechanism was a change really in the biology related to atherosclerosis uh, or a disease intervention as opposed to something else. The other thing that was important is unlike the SGLT2s, there was no signal, absolutely no signal in terms of improvement of heart failure. And also when one starts to look at some of the uh, subgroup analysis, the message seemed to be here, it seemed to do better in people who were less sick as opposed to the SGLT2 data that seemed to be uh, equally good in people who were a bit sicker. So when you start to look, the results were best in the people with a short duration of diabetes. They were actually best in the people who had a known history of cardiac disease because in these trials, about 20% of people did not have any known cardiac disease, but that same group were also younger. And so one could argue that in fact, maybe that's an important element for the positive issue. 
issues. It was best in people with no history of uh, heart failure and also best in people with modest degrees of renal dysfunction as opposed to more serious degrees of renal dysfunction. So again, it looked like they were better drugs for people who were a bit healthier. The other thing that I show you on the bottom is when you look at geographical distribution, there is an interesting result, which is that there was no positives to be had in the United States. And there's a lot of ongoing discussion whether in fact the FDA will approve this drug for an indication in terms of um, uh, a reduction in cardiac death like they did for empagliflozin because of that finding. I'm going to skip ahead. I'll, uh, I guess I'm slow. I'll finish up by telling you quickly about the SUSTAIN trial. Now, the SUSTAIN trial, like the others, is not a dedicated cardiovascular outcome trial. It is simply a registration trial that was done to accumulate enough MACE uh, events so that they could be included to get the drug approved in the United States. But this is a very powerful GLP-1 drug. So what you see is big differences in terms of hemoglobin A1C and weight, much bigger in in this trial who received the drug versus those who different. And that's important because we have a positive primary outcome, but what you can see is a much larger benefit than any of the other trials, which had an improvement in the relative rate of anywhere from about 13 to 14 percent. Here you see there's almost a 25 percent reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, which again has engendered a lot of discussion. And, and when you match up leader and sustain, while some of the results are similar, like improvements in terms of nephropathy, you see very different uh, findings in some of the subgroup analysis. And so there's a lot of ongoing discussion uh, how we, what we actually take away from that and what it means. The other thing I'll point out to you on the bottom is one of the things that have been seen with sustain, and at least there was a signal with leader, is an increased rate of retinopathy. And this actually is reminiscent of what we learned many years ago, using insulin to rapidly improve blood glucose control and having transient episodes of worsening retinopathy in people with modest established retinopathy. It's thought that this is the same mechanism with these drugs. Uh, the other thing I'll point out to you is that we thought, well, the reason that leader and sustain were positive and that elixir was not is because elixir is a short-acting drug and these are long-acting drugs and that's what, you know, that's the take-home message. But in fact, you probably know that the long-acting exenatide preparation, uh, Excel, will be reported on in the next uh, uh, EASD meeting. It also has not shown positives, which has raised interesting differences between the two uh, the two kinds of agents. So here's my summary related to the GLP-1 drugs. Class effects, at least for loraglutide and semaglutide, reductions in three-point mace, no improvement in heart failure, and a marked uh, reduction in nephropathy. It takes longer. Um, and also, uh, we have to think a little bit about retinopathy. So these are my final thoughts. And these are, I think, the world is going in terms of thinking about cardiovascular drugs. Uh, and cardiac and renal outcomes in type 2 diabetes. A paradigm shift is occurring. Uh, I'm telling my young people that they are right in the middle of watching diabetes care transition away from diabetologists versus cardiologists versus nephrologists, all sort of doing their thing, so that now we're really starting to interact and overlap because our drugs have such potentially amazing effects on cardiovascular outcomes and renal outcomes, and we're all going to be much smarter about using different agents and what we're trying to do in terms of uh, monitoring outcomes. Uh, the GLP-1 and the SJLT2 drugs, while both having benefits, appear to be quite different. And so one of the things we need as a specialty is we need much more information about indications. Who gets what drug? How do we screen people? Who do we identify? And one of the big unknowns is can we use these drugs together and actually get synergistic effects uh, in terms of cardiovascular outcome? Uh, I think we spend a lot of time talking about subgroup analysis, which is not usually very useful because studies are not powered for that. And the last thing I would talk about, there's a lot of talk in the United States that these drugs are probably good for primary cardiovascular uh, protection, of which we have no data. So we must be very careful in saying that. I'm sorry I've got too long, ladies and gentlemen. It was a pleasure. Thank you.